Good evening. My name is Carl Kahala. I'm an instructor of business here, and I'd just like to welcome all of you to our community lecture series. This is the fourth event that we've held covering Russia, and we're excited for all of you to join us. You can view any of the previous presentations on our UWM Washington County campus website. Um, you can also just do a Google search. Um, if you search for community lecture series, um, UWM Washington County, you will um, also come across it that way. If there are any students here, please let me know um, if, if you're here to receive extra credit um, so that we can track what class you're uh, here for. Um, so again, it's wonderful to, to see all of you here, and tonight I'm excited to introduce our guest, Graham Reed. Graham is the Director of Collections and Exhibitions at the Museum of Wisconsin Art, right here in West Bend, Wisconsin. Born in Scotland, Reed graduated from the University of Glasgow in 1990 and Indiana State University in 1993 with master's degrees. He pre he's previously worked at the John Kohler Art Center in Sheboygan, the Art Museum, Art Museum of Greater Lafayette, Indiana, and the Swope Art Museum in Terre Haute, Indiana. Tara Holt. Tara Holt. I, I can't hear everyone very well, so I'm doing the best I can. Tara, Tara, how do I pronounce? Tara Holt. Tara Holt. Okay. Now uh, it's it's kind of like when I I try to introduce one of my. Um, uh, someone visiting my class, and I was trying to say Manitowoc, and I just couldn't say that one. <laughs> um, so he's an award-winning writer on the arts. He's taught art history and the humanities at Indiana State University and Purdue, and he's a regular guest lecturer at various Wisconsin institutions. So please join me in issuing Graham a warm welcome. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, everybody, for coming out on such a lovely evening. If you have not seen Friday's forecast, I suggest you don't look. Um, just a little back. Is this loud enough? Okay. So, so just a little background on this this talk. Actually, I did my master's thesis on Stalin's cult of personality because I was always kind of interested in the dichotomy between what the public messaging or public perception or the public imaging is of politics and what the reality behind that messaging is. And it really first intrigued me as an undergrad and then I wrote my master's thesis on it. But I've broken my kind of talk tonight down into really five chapters. The origins, the physical Stalin, Stalin and children, Stalin and collectivization, and the death of Stalin. And um, so we shall get started. So. O great Stalin, O leader of the people, thou who didst give birth to man, thou who didst make fertile the earth, thou who dost rejuvenate the centuries, thou who givest blossom to the spring. It's a lot of accomplishment for Yosef Bessarionis Zhugashvili, who was born on December 18th, 1878, in the Georgian village of Gori, then part of the Tiflis governorate of the Russian Empire, and home to a mix of Georgian, Armenian, Russian, and Jewish communities. His parents, Bessarion and Ekaterine, were ethnically Georgian, and Yosip grew up speaking the Georgian language, and he was their only child to survive past infancy. And these were incredibly humble beginnings for someone who would rise to such prominence as a leader of a world superpower, but when one reaches such heights, one always has a past that, for good or ill, might need to be edited. Uh, with Stalin, it wasn't just the past that needed to be edited, but the present as well, for almost 30 years. But before we start with Stalin, you have to start with Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, better known as Lenin. Leader of the Bolshevik Party, Lenin successfully and ruthlessly led the revolution in 1917 that ended centuries of Tsarist rule over Russia. For seven years, until his death in 1924, he ruled the nascent Soviet Union. While he positioned himself as primus inter pares, first amongst equal, Stalin, um, Lenin, knew that deep down, Russians liked a figurehead. 
And here's a, an image from, it was published in the October magazine in 1920, and you can see Stalin, I mean, you can see Lenin right in the middle, Trotsky is just off to his right, but you would look long and hard to try and find Stalin in this particular image. He's not there in 1920. Um, so deep down, Lenin knew that the Russians liked a figurehead, like a czar, one accredited with divine sanction to lead. Lenin was the undoubted leader and allowed himself to be put forward as the leader. And, you know, through various means of painting, here's Lenin, you know, working away on his paper all by himself. In 1922, Stalin gained election to the position of the general secretary of the party, based on seniority rather than popularity. And given Lenin's supremacy at the time, this was not considered a danger. And Stalin was recognized by Lenin as a good administrator. Lenin also recognized Stalin's desire for recognition and an acknowledgement, given his insecurity about not actually having been present at the crucial events of the revolution, and that his thick Georgian accent and comparative lack of education marked him as being a provincial. In 1919, Trotsky was awarded the Order of the Red Banner for his victory at Petrograd during the Russian Civil War. Kamenev suggested that Stalin get the same award. The suggestion was met with disbelief. Bukharin explained, can't you understand? This is Lenin's idea. Stalin can't live unless he has what someone else has. He will never forgive it. The award was given to muted applause at the Bolshoi. Stalin was not there, perhaps well aware that the award was undeserved. By 1923, as Lenin's health was failing, the four potential successors were, in order, Trotsky, Kamenev, Zinoviev, and lastly, Stalin. And plans were afoot to eliminate Stalin from the running. Upon learning of her letter from Trotsky to Lenin, Stalin phoned and berated Lenin's wife on the grounds that the ailing Lenin should not be involved in such correspondence which violated the doctor's orders. The phone call was not really based on true concern for Lenin, but on insecurity and je jealousy over Trotsky's genuine closeness to Lenin. The latter, Lenin, demanded an apology from Stalin and threatened cessation of relations. Lenin already regarded Stalin as too rude and offensive to succeed him, a declaration that Lenin was ready to make at the 12th Party Congress scheduled for March 1924, in a speech that was known, or has become known, as Lenin's Testament. And I quote, Comrade Stalin, having become Secretary General, has unlimited authority concentrated in his hands, and I am not sure whether he will always be capable of using that authority with sufficient caution. Comrade Trotsky, on the other hand, as his struggle against the um, whites on the question of the People's Commissariat of Communications has already proved, is distinguished not only by outstanding ability. He is personally perhaps the most capable man in the present Central Committee, but he has displayed excessive self-assurance and shown excessive preoccupation with the purely administrative side of the work. These two qualities of the two outstanding leaders of the present Central Committee can inadvertently lead to a split. And if our party does not take steps to avert this, the split may come unexpectedly. Lenin felt that Stalin had more power than he could handle and might be dangerous if he was Lenin's successor. In a postscript written a few weeks later, Lenin recommended Stalin's removal from the position of the General Secretary of the party. And I quote, Stalin is too coarse. And this defect, although quite tolerable in our midst and in dealing amongst us communists, becomes intolerable in a secretary general. That is why I suggest that the comrades think about a way of removing Stalin from that post and appointing another man in his stead, who in all other respects differs from comrade Stalin in having only one advantage, namely that of being more tolerant, more loyal, more polite, and more considerate to the comrades, less capricious, etc. This circumstance may appear to be negligible detail, but I think that from the standpoint of safeguards against a split, and from the standpoint of what I wrote about the relationship between Stalin and Trotsky, it is not a minor detail, but it is a detail which can assume decisive importance. So, pretty clear, Lenin did not regard Stalin as the ideal successor. Unfortunately, Lenin died, Lenin died in January, which meant his clear denunciation of Stalin was never actually delivered. 
And when Lenin died, Trotsky was in Tiflis on the Black Sea. Stalin seized his moment and put himself in charge of the funeral. And here we have a magnificent painting of Lenin lying in state with various members of the Politburo around him. Stalin advocated against the wishes of Lenin's widow to have Lenin embalmed and buried in a mausoleum in Red Square, which of course is still there to this very day. But in pushing himself forward as a successor to Lenin, Stalin had his work cut out. He was not the player and he wished to be with regard to the revolution. To many, he was a side player. However, Stalin skillfully played the different factions against each other and built up his influence as the general secretary of the party, steadily packing the Politburo with his supporters until in the late 1920s, he came to hold dictatorial power. His defeated rival, late Leon Trotsky, who was expelled from the Communist Party in 1927, he was exiled from the Soviet Union in 1929 and in 1940 was murdered by an agent of Stalin in Mexico. Trotsky and Kamenev were also subsequently edited out of photographs. So here's a picture. There's Lenin and Trotsky is the one with his hand up to his brim. And then in the top left, top right picture, you can see Trotsky has magically disappeared. And then you can also see that Kamenev, which is... He's the one with the beard and the dark hat, kind of, not the guy in the corner, but the guy just behind him. And you can, just in front of the boy, you can see he magically disappears as well. So as you fall out of favor, you don't just fall out of favor, you disappear. Even though photography was well developed, there was not the photographic record of Lenin and Stalin being the close allies and leaders that Stalin wanted to give him legitimacy. There were, however, pictures of Lenin with Trotsky and Kamenev out there, and these had to be changed, as I just showed. If photography could not be bent to the will of Stalin, then art would have to step up and fill in, and did it ever. Scenes from revolutionary history were created that increasingly pushed Stalin into a role of confidant and collaborator that simply was not true. So here's another great picture. This is Lenin giving a, an address to the troops in Moscow in May 1920. Just on the stairwell there, you can see Kamenev and Trotsky just at the, on the footsteps up to that, and then magically they've disappeared. Sometimes you'll also see this picture where they'll just, they'll simply cut the picture right where that kind of post is. They'll just simply just chop the picture off. So they, you know, by our, by our, the thing, what, what always interests me is by our standards today, this is pretty crude photoshopping, but you have to remember this was probably pr printed in Pravda, it's in black and white, it's on cheap newsprint, and then if you have no reason to believe that the pictures are being edited, if you've never seen the original picture, then how, who are you to doubt that uh, Trotsky and Kamenev were even there? According to you, look at that picture. They're not there. So. Here we have Stalin, Lemon, and Kamenev right in the center of the, the photograph on the, on the right. Up at the top, you can kind of see it's been reduced to three. Then it gets reduced to Stalin and Lenin, and then it just gets reduced to Stalin. Same picture, just constantly playing around with it. But of course, once you've got to rewrite history, and you know you can ed do a little editing with photographs, but you can, it's hard to kind of come up with an entire scene. Um, so here's Lenin at the Winter Palace, and you can kind of see Stalin's a little far back. He's kind of back towards the table. Another version of the same painting, and you know, Stalin's still kind of a little far back. He's right there by the pillar. And then all of a sudden, oh, look, there's Stalin. He's right up front, right behind him. Right behind his good friend Lenin. Yes, just keep, uh, keep repainting the picture. And then, of course, here's Lenin arriving back from exile at the Finland station. And there's Stalin right behind him, which, of course, Stalin was not actually there at the Finland station. But according to this painting, there he is. Uh, they, they'd still, Lenin and Stalin did meet at Tamerfors in Finland in 1905, but there was no cameras there. So, of course, they had to... They had to paint the image. And what I just think is kind of interesting is look at the reaction of the, the people around. I mean, there's the waitress kind of like, oh, my goodness. And then this guy's like reading his paper and he's like, oh, wow, Lenin and Stalin. I mean, it's like, the, it's like you know, it's like he's just walked into the room and everybody's like, oh, my goodness, look who it is. 
It's Stalin. And then here's Stalin working away, trying to be very collegial with all these people from different parts of the Soviet Union, but of course he's doing it under the watchful gaze of his dear comrade, Lenin. And then, you know, Lenin and Stalin. What's interesting, about, what's interesting about these particular pictures of Lenin and Stalin that they put together is it usually looks like Stalin's the one doing the talking and Lenin's doing the listening. And he's going, yes, really, is that right? Oh, tell me more, tell me more about it. And, you know, here, this is a very famous picture of the two of them. Um, this was, the one on the right was actually taken, a big part, the one on the left was actually taken just after Stalin had had his, the first of his strokes. And uh, they were roughly about the same height, but it's kind of interesting that Stalin kind of sits a little bit further forward on a little bit of a higher stool and kind of sits up just to make himself look that's that little bit taller. And then, of course, it was created in sculpture, Lenin and Stalin together, you know, like the two closest confidants you could ever get. And then here's other examples of Lenin arriving at the Smolny and he's got his hand on Stalin's shoulder. And then there's, you know, as if Lenin and Stalin were conducting the civil war between them. And again, Stalin's the one who's doing the pointing. Oh, this is how we should maneuver the troops. And Lenin's just standing there listening to him. So it's, you know, again, just using art to create this, this um, relationship that, as I said, quite simply was not there. And then, you know, there's Stalin and Lenin. You know, he's on his deathbed. And who's right there with him? His best buddy, Stalin, you know, listening to the words of the dying leader. And then all of a sudden, you know, Stalin becomes the sole leader, the organizer of the October Revolution, which we know he really was. And what's also interesting about this is how, you know, Stalin's the central picture. Everybody's absolutely enraptured by what he's saying. One guy's taking notes. And there is not a single image of Lenin anywhere in the background. So it's all of a sudden, it just becomes all about Stalin. And then... Um, so here's a band, you know, one from 1930. So Lenin's been dead for six years. And they're talking about the you know, socialist construction. There's Lenin out front, but then there's this rather incredibly menacing image of Stalin kind of creeping up from the back. And of course, once Stalin becomes the sole leader, then he's really got to kind of get busy rewriting history. So there's 1925 is the 14th party conference. So it's within about a year of... Lenin dying, and then you can see the same picture from 1939, how most of the, uh, most of the people in the first picture have been eliminated. And, you can, and again, by our standards, I mean, that painted, that, that it, you know, the photoshopping looks really pretty bad, but, you know, you can see that that really is probably a legitimate photograph, and then that one just looks like, because what I, what I also love about this is, not only do they eliminate people, they move the painting, because you can see the painting here, the painting is way off to the left, and then all of a sudden it magically comes, you know, the whole painting magically moves right across. This is also another great piece of um, editing. This is, um, this is in Red Square, it's the Politburo, it's 1934. Basically what they're doing is there's members of the Chelyuskin expedition which actually attempted to sail through the Northwest Passage in the Arctic Circle. Um, the expedition failed, the boat was crushed by ice, all the people survived, so there's this great parade walking through Red Square, and you can kind of see how you know, the, it's been edited. But the, the, the greatest thing about this, just like they moved the painting in that previous picture, on the one on the left, you can actually see some trash on the street. Well, if you're going to be going to do a little photoshopping, you know, literally, let's take care of the trash, and we'll just edit out the, out the garbage on, on Red Square as well. And then here's one of the, this is kind of one of the classic images of how Stalin ended up becoming kind of like the sole leader. You've got um, Antipov, Stalin, Kirov, and Shvernik in the top left. And then all of a sudden, um, Antipov disappears. Antipov was executed in 1939. Then you've got Kirov. Kirov was executed in, or killed in 1934. Amazingly, Shvernik must have done something right because he actually died a natural death in 1970, which... It's actually really quite remarkable. But again, you can kind of see how you've kind of gone from photograph to kind of weird looking photograph, photograph, and then it, essentially you've got a painting right at the end. 
And then this is another kind of a great image. This is Nikolai Yezhov, who was basically the head of the secret police, a particularly nasty piece of work. This is on the Mo Moscow Volga Canal, and once Ye ne Yezhov was executed in 1940, well, you know, we can't have him hanging out with Stalin anymore, so he gets photoshopped out of the, out of the picture. So, Stalin has now created, he's eliminated, literally and figuratively eliminated his rivals. Now we have to look at the physical Stalin. Stronger than steel is thy name, brighter than sun is thy glory, sweeter than honey is thy word, live forever, beloved leader. Given the magnitude of the cult in the hype according to Stalin, one it might expect him to be a stellar physical specimen. Not so. Raised in Georgia by a drunken, violent father, he was indoctrinated with a philosophy of revenge and an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He spoke Russian with a thick Georgian accent, and in fact his teachers in school actually meted out severe punishment for pupils who were slow in learning Russian. And in fact, Stalin apparently once told a Japanese journalist that I am not a European man, but an Asian, a Russified Georgian. Physically, Stalin was not a particularly attractive man. His face was badly pockmarked as a result of childhood encounter with smallpox. And you can kind of see there on the left, it's pretty much unretouched, and you can kind of see that his face is, isn't quite smooth. But then, you know, he gets the Hollywood treatment, and boy, you know, that mustache gets a little, little trim. He's got that lovely smooth face. His hair is, you know, he gets the Hollywood treatment. And here you can see in various photographs, you can kind of see where, you know, again, the, the kind of um, the texture of his skin um, on the left, in the center, and then you can kind of see the Hollywoodization where everything kind of gets nicely smoothed off on the right-hand side. Now, so at age 12, Stalin was stuck, struck by a horse-drawn carriage, and the result after crude remedial surgery, actually gave him a stunted left arm, which was actually four inches shorter than his right. And you can kind of see here the fact that his arm, you know, he really can't do much with it. I mean, you're just going to see his arm kind of hangs at his side. He had some, obviously, some use of his fingers, usually in most cases holding cigarettes. Um, but he really had very little use of his left arm. So here's photographs of him. And this is a particularly interesting photograph I found. You, you can kind of see he's got some use of his left arm, but you can see it's very awkwardly kind of, he's kind of lifted his arm around the little girl. I'm going to get back to the little girl in a, in a, in a, in a minute. But you can kind of see he, his arm really can't do much with it. But of course in paintings, it's not a problem. He can use that left arm just like everybody else just resting on there in that lovely painting. He can use his left arm whichever way he wants. Now, the thing is with Stalin, Stalin, depending on the sources, he was anywhere between five foot four and five foot seven. So he wasn't a particularly tall man. He wasn't a particularly imposing presence. Um, his Politburo comrade, Clement Voroshilov, was actually over six feet tall, but, you know, that's where the cult comes in. So here's Stalin with Voroshilov, and you can see, you know, hats aside, Stalin's got to be at least a couple of inches taller than him. And then here they are standing on top of the Kremlin. Stalin is clearly taller than Voroshilov, despite the fact that he was probably about five to six inches shorter. But given his true physical appearance, it was imperative that the cult relied on art. So... Stalin you know, becomes you know, this solo figure, so you, he, becomes this, he becomes this monumental figure. So here he is above the parade, the military parade in Red Square. He is with a library. That's probably one of the more honest. Stalin was a voracious reader, um, but you also see you know, how he's wearing this kind of white military uniform, which obviously would not be standard issue. And then here's, a, here's another one of that um, picture where he's making himself look look taller than, than Lenin while they're stand, sitting on the bench. So, as Stalin, they actually made very relatively few personal appearances because once the cult starts going, once these paintings and once these photographs start getting out there, then the 
dichotomy to the reality becomes more and more. So if you think, well, he's six, he's the same height as Voroshil, and all of a sudden this five foot seven guy walks in with a badly pockmarked face and a left arm that doesn't work very well, you're kind of like, whoa, that's, who's, yeah, who's this guy? So actually his public appearances became fewer and fewer and fewer. Also, he was somewhat paranoid about being assassinated, which didn't uh, help with the public appearances. Now, thou regardest the birth of day, the stars of the morning thy will obey, thy incomparable genius mounts to the heavens, thy profundity plums the bedrock of ocean. As was written about Stalin by Suleiman Stalsky in 1937. And Stalin actually had three children of his own, Vasily, Svetlana, and Jacob. Stalin married his first wife, Ekaterina Svanidze, in 1906, and when she died, Stalin apparently said, this creature softened my heart of stone. He had a son, Yakov, who often frustrated, he annoyed Stalin. Yakov had a daughter, Galina, before fighting for the Red Army in the Second World War. He was captured by the German army. He was offered as part of a prisoner exchange. Stalin refused, and Jacob committed suicide. Stalin's second wife was, there's Vasily Svetlana and Stalin. Stalin's second wife was Nadezhda, Nadezhda Aleluyeva. They had two biological children, Vasily and Svetlana, and another adopted son, and Artyom Sergeev in 1921. And during his marriage to Nadezhda, Stalin had affairs with many women, most of whom were either fellow revolutionaries or their wives. Nadezhda suspected this was the case and committed suicide in 1932. Stalin regarded Vasily as spoiled and often chastised his behavior. And as Stalin's son, Vasily nevertheless was promoted through the ranks of the Red Army and was allowed a lavish lifestyle. Conversely, Stalin actually had a very affectionate relationship with Svetlana and was very fond of Artyom. And in later life, he Stalin, surprisingly enough, he disapproved of Svetlana's various suitors and husbands, putting a strain on their relationship. After the Second World War, he made little time for his children and his family played a decreasingly important role in his life. After Stalin's death, Svetlana changed her name from Stalin to Aleluyeva and defected to the United States. But the Stalin cult was so ingrained by the early 1930s that children born after Lenin's death would grow up knowing no other version of events, and indoctrination began at infancy. In 1934, Stalin, Kirov, and Andrei Zhdanov formed the committee to oversee the rewriting of textbooks. The rewriting was to place Stalin at the center and the beginning of everything, and for Kirov and Zhdanov, they might have felt that helping with this important task would curry, curry favor with their boss and provide protection, quite the opposite. Stalin knew they knew, Stalin knew that they knew how much history had been rewritten. Both received show trials in the 1930s and were executed. Can't have somebody knowing the truth being around. And in textbooks, Stalin was portrayed as the embodiment of the party, of wisdom, goodness, civil and military success. To work hard and succeed was to please Stalin, and here you can see a a group of children doing their homework and they're doing it under the very watchful gaze of Stalin. And to fail was by implication to disappoint Stalin. And you can see a painting here from very late in Stalin's reign, 1952, low marks again. The dog's the only one who still loves him. Everybody else is looking at him like, oh, you let Stalin down. But before children could read, they were bombarded with images of Stalin as their overseer and their friend. And you can see here, I mean, there's just poster after poster after poster. And there's Stalin in the background, you know, overseeing the music lesson in the, in the little uh, peasant hut, hanging the painting on the wall, holding the little hammer and sickle flag and, you know, putting up the paper, the painting. And then you can see the one bottom center is like no matter what part of the Soviet Union front that was, there's Lenin, but there's Stalin up on the wall behind you, and there's Stalin in his white suit again with a young pioneer looking out over, you know, the bountiful, um, you know, perfect fields of the Soviet Union. And while Lenin may have been credited with asserting that the primary purpose of school was to cultivate a communist morality, Stalin was deemed the role model in all other respects. 
the cult actually took on a quasi-religious role, putting Stalin forward as some kind of like Mother Mary figure. You can kind of see the virgin and child, and then there's Stalin with the little girl. And here's another one where he, you know, he's holding up some little kid with flowers in one hand. So, I mean, it's just the same, ver different version of the same painting. But again, one of the reasons I put this one is, is look, uh, amazing how he can just hold a kid up with his left arm, almost, you know, he's just holding him up with his left arm that he could barely use. And, you know, here's Stalin again, the white suit, surrounded by these adoring children and flowers, and they've got the toy plane, and the kids get the little picture of the Kremlin and Stalin's just, you know, being the benevolent father to all the children. Now, Stalin's own familial relations were surprisingly not as ideal as portrayed. Upon meeting his mother for the first time in, for many years in 1927, the old woman rejoiced as if wings had grown. Stalin growled, you here too, old whore? Children were urged to sow their loyalty to their parents, after Stalin, of course. And the story goes that a three-year-old arrived home from school one day to tell her rather surprised father, you are not my father anymore. Stalin is my father. He gives me everything I have. And art was very much a primary vehicle for the indoctrination of children. So is photography. Here you have the, the picture of Gelia Mar Markazova with Stalin, Molotov, and Voroshilov. And you can, that's the one I used you know, previously, the very awkward use of his hand. And again, this image suggests Stalin's love of children from the most farthest flung areas of the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, it was a sham. Her father was arrested and shot, and her mother simply disappeared. And here you can see you know, the whole Stalin, the friend of the little children. You can see the photograph there. And then you can see the other folks down here, and then you can see the, pic the paintings being changed and altered and actually used as a banner in the background. And children were expected to conform to modes of conduct that mimic Stalin. No smoking, no gambling, no foul language, and modest behavior. Stalin smoked heavily, cursed profanely, gambled, and always won. I mean, who's going to dare beat Stalin? And had numerous affairs. And children were also to bear partial guilt for the sins of their parents, who were usually innocent but based on guilty, but made guilty on baseless charges. In 1937, a law passed decreed that if the head of a family was arrested, tried and found guilty, the wife would get eight years in a labor camp, the children five years. When Anastas Mikoyan's two sons were arrested, Bukharin asked Stalin why for being a pair of free thinkers, that's what, replied Stalin. Youth were also co-opted into the cult outside of school through the Komsomol, the all-unionist Len Communist League of Youth, which was an organization for young people aged 14 to 28 that was primarily a political organ for spreading communist teachings. And there you can see... You've got the Little Octoberist for the very young. An active participation in the Consumol was also considered an important factor in gaining membership and eventually leadership positions in the Communist Party. For thousands of children, however, the Consumol was not an option, particularly, as I said, if their parents had been arrested. As a result of Stalinist terror and mass repression, hundreds of thousands of parents were arrested and placed in the famous Gulag camps. And in fact, resolution number 2213 stated that children up to the age of two must be kept in confinement along with their mothers. And here's children in a gulag nursery. And oh, look what's on the wall. Picture of Stalin. Um, they were also placed in camp nurseries. Other children could be born in the gulag because some prisoners were pre pregnant upon arrival. Others became pregnant in the camps. And there were actually, you know, they actually took identity photographs of children who were in the camps. And in 1935, the introduction of Article 12 of the Criminal Code also permitted children from the age of 12 to be sentenced as adults and interned in the gulags. This law was used to round up the children of those who'd earlier been arrested for political crimes based on the belief that, quote, an apple never falls far from the tree. And many street children, the waifs and strays, commonly known as Bez Prizorni, also committed crimes, most commonly theft, and were sent to the camps as punishment where they found themselves living in bare, dirty cells uh, where they mixed with much older, more dangerous criminals. 
and when Stalin died in 1920, 1953, kindergarten children were assembled in order to cry because Uncle Stalin is dead. Cry, children, your own dear father is dead. Now, under Soviet rule, the cities were brought under control relatively easily. The vast countryside was a different matter. There was the issue with the kulaks. In Russian and Soviet history, a kulak was a wealthy or a prosperous peasant, generally characterized as one who owned a relatively large farm, several head of cattle and horses, and who was financial, financially capable of employing hired labor and leasing land. Before the Russian Revolution of 1917, the kulaks were major figures in the peasant village. They often lent money, provided mortgages, played central roles in the village's social and administrative affairs. During the war communism period between 1918 and 1921, the Soviet government undermined the Kulak's position by organizing committees of poor peasants to administer the villages and to supervise the requisitioning of grain from the richer peasants. But the introduction in 1921 of the new economic policy favored the Kulaks. And although the Soviet government considered Kulaks to be capitalists and therefore enemies of socialism, it adopted various incentives to encourage peasants to increase agricultural production and enrich themselves. And the most successful peasants, less than 4%, became kulaks and assumed their traditional roles in the village social structure, often rivaling the authority of the new Soviet officials. And in 1927, the Soviet government began to shift its peasant policy by increasing the kulaks' taxes and restricting their right to leased land. 1929, it began a drive for rapid collectivization of agriculture. No place for priests or kulaks in our collective farm. The kulaks vigorously opposed the efforts, as you might expect, to force the peasants to give up their small, privately owned farms and George large cooperative agricultural establishments. And at the end of 1929, a campaign to liquidate the kulaks as a class was launched by the government. And under his first five-year plan, collectivization was introduced as a way, according to the policies of the socialist leaders, to boost agricultural production through the organization of small land holdings, many peasants into one large collective farm. All large collectivized farms were cultivated by the farmers with the help of tools pooled together. The profits of the farms were shared amongst the cultivators. And theoretically, this seemed to make sense until you factor in that the policies were implemented by politicians to be carried out by farmers. As this was a program imposed from the highest level, failure was not an option, and the cult of Stalin was employed with full force to ensure it had the appearance of success. So, you know, can't plow a field without a picture of Stalin on the front of your tractor. That's just going to help everything remarkably well. Then, of course, you've got art coming to the rescue. Here's, you know, fields of just yeah, the, most, the greatest grain ever, and they're flying the red flag, threshing on the farm. Again, everybody's just pitching in, everybody's healthy, everybody's working really hard to bring in this, you know, enormously bountiful harvest. And here's a, you know, coal cause woman with, you know, just colossal pumpkins. The only problem was, this caused, there was a famine. And it was, the, the origins of the famine, and particularly in the Ukraine, lay with Stalin to collectivize that, this collectivization of 1929. Basically, Communist Party agitators forced peasants to relinquish their land, personal property, and sometimes housing to the collective farms. And they deported the so-called kulaks, the wealthier peasants, as well as any peasant who, who resisted collectivization. It led to, surprise, surprise, a drop in production, a disorganization of the rural economy, and food shortages. And in Ukraine, in, by 1932-33, you had food shortages. Here's Ukrainian scavenging for potatoes. There was also peasant rebellions, including armed uprising in some parts of Ukraine. Once grain quotas had been set, they were expected to be fulfilled. That they were unrealistic in the first place was neither here nor there. Quotas were quotas, the gain, grain had to be delivered. The problem was the quotas were unrealistic. They couldn't be fulfilled without causing massive shortages in republics such as the Ukraine, which was traditionally one of the highest grain producers in the whole of the Soviet Union. 
And farmers, realizing that the quotas were unfillable and would leave them with not enough for their own needs, took to hiding and hoarding grain. And this was an action with deadly consequences. Farmers found to have hidden grain were summarily executed, and the consequences were famine. And with any such event, accurate death figures are hard to assign, but a reasonable estimate is 4 million of what Ukrainians have come to call the Holodomor, the massive famine in the early 1930s. And this famine was actually a direct assault on the Ukrainian peasantry because they had stubbornly resisted collectivization. And indirectly, it was an attack on the Ukrainian village, which had traditionally been a part of their national culture. If deliberate nature is underscored by the fact that no physical basis existed for famine in Ukraine, and the Ukrainian grain harvest of 1932 had resulted in below average yields, in part because of the collectivization chaos, but it was more than sufficient to sustain the population. At the same time, a law was passed in 1932, making the theft of socialist property a capital crime, leading to scenes in which peasants faced the firing squad for stealing as little as a sack of wheat from state storehouses. And the, Europe the rural population was left with insufficient food to feed itself. And here you have queuing for food and literally people dropping dead of malnutrition on the street and uh, there was this widespread famine. And, uh, but Moscow refused to provide relief, and in fact, during this time, Mo the Soviet Union exported more than a million tons of grain during this particular period. And the famine subsided only after the 1933 harvest had been completed. The traditional Ukrainian village had essentially been destroyed, and settlers from Russia had brought, were brought in to repopulate the devastated countryside. By 1934, when approximately 75% of the farms in the Soviet Union had been collectivized, most kulaks, as well as millions of other peasants who opposed collectivization, had been deported to remote regions of the Soviet Union or arrested and their land and property confiscated. And although the famine received national cover international coverage, Soviet authorities flatly denied that the existence of the famine, both at the time that it was raging and afterwards. Because as far as the cult was concerned, collectivization was a resounding success with happy peasants working hard to bring in bountiful harvests. So 1937, again, here's this massive collective farm celebration. There's the picture of Stalin looming over everything from the top, but everybody's happy, healthy. You can see the musicians over on the left-hand side, the big samovar in the center. The tables are just groaning with food, collective farm holiday in 1937. Again, just you know, the bountiful harvest of being on a collective farm. And 1949, you know, the peasants are just, they're healthy, they're happy, they're working hard. And you can just see, I mean, the, the grain is, you know, it's thick on the ground. I mean, it's just, you know, it's like snow. It's just so thick on the ground. And it was only really in the late 1980s that officials made a guardage acknowledgement that something had been amiss in the Ukraine in the early 1930s. Now, Stalin, and I just got these two relatively late paintings of Stalin. This one's from 1948, and you can kind of see there's Stalin in his, you know, very modest white jacket, and he's standing over this, this landscape where you can see the electricity pylons and you can see the tractors in the field. Over on the left, you can see the smokestacks of industry belching smoke as if, you know, everything is right in the land. And, you know, by 1950, again, you've kind of got Stalin just there. He is at the center and everybody's just kind of worshiping him as he kind of just modestly stands there and claps. Now, Stalin died on March 5th, 1953, from a massive hemorrhagic stroke. Oh, he was also, there was, not just in the Soviet Union, but in Czechoslovakia and Germany, statues were going up to Stalin by the end of his lifetime. But he died in 1953 from a massive hemorrhagic stroke. The prospects of recovery are arguable, but death could likely have been avoided if he'd received medical help sooner. That he didn't says much about the fear he instilled in his close of advisors. The following story implies Stalin could exercise great cruelty even when in a playful mood. 
It is common knowledge that Stalin prohibited his guards from entering his private bedchambers on pain of death. The apocryphal story goes that on one day in a test of their resilience, Stalin decided to scream as if in great agony. When his loyal guards came to their master's aides, they were duly executed for failing to follow orders. And when Stalin did actually endure a paralyzing seizure, seizure while alone in his bedroom, none of his guards dared come to his aid for the very fear of the tangible reprisals. He was later found semi-conscious by the deputy commandant of Konsevo lying on the floor of his room. Unfortunately, many of the most competent doctors had been exiled or killed due to a fabricator's doctor's plot against Stalin, and he died within days. Indeed, when he had gone for his regular checkup in 1951, Stalin's doctor told him to rest more and work less, words that Stalin did not take well. And his biographer, Roman Brackman, wrote in The Secret File of Joseph Stalin, quote, the doctor was arrested and charged with working as a spy for British intelligence. And upon his death and four days of mourning, which saw thousands flock to Moscow to pay respects, there was only one place for such a great man to go, into Lenin's tomb to, on Red Square to lie alongside his dear friend, Lenin. And as the years following his death saw the crimes of Stalin become known, his 1961, his body was removed and reinterred in the necropolis down the side of the Kremlin, and his name was removed from Lenin's tomb. And you can see here, this is very much a rogues gallery down the side of the, the Kremlin, but you can see a large number of people paying their respects to Stalin. Art had been a big part of creating the Stalin cult, and it was employed in diminishing it. In 1947, Vladimir Serov painted Lenin proclaiming Soviet power at the Second Congress of Soviets, and there is Stalin right behind him, supporting him. 1962, Serov was told to repaint the painting, and look, Stalin magically disappears. What goes around comes around. Remember I showed you images where Stalin works his way forward, now Stalin works his way out of the painting. But that being said, the cult lived on and lived on. During his lifetime, Stalin's childhood home in Gori, which was basically a rather un, unspectacular little shack, was actually enshrined in a big classical looking sculpture that went right over the top of it. And then today it is still there and is a popular <coughs> tourist attraction. An attraction for who, you might ask? In, 19, in May of 2021, 56% of Russians polled by the independent Levada Center agreed that Stalin was a great leader. That was double the figure of 2016 when the Stalinization of mass consciousness has already been a clear trend for several years. In 2017, 32% of Russians polled considered Vladimir Putin the most outstanding figure in Russian history, right up there with Alexander Pushkin, <coughs> but outranked only by Stalin. Now, with 15% of the vote, he only just makes the top five behind Peter the Great and just ahead of Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space. And attitudes to Stalin in Russia are intrinsically tied to the Soviet Union's victory in World War II, over which Stalin presided and which has become the sacred cornerstone of Russian ident modern Russian identity. The Russian parliament has passed a new law making it illegal to equate the wartime actions of the Soviets with Nazi Germany. And in July 2021, Vladimir Putin signed the document which also prohibits the decisive, prohibits denying the decisive role of the Soviet people in the victory over fascism. And to people outside of Russia, this might seem deeply shocking and incomprehensible that Stalin's popularity is going, growing. Yet it is an entirely natural consequence of the policy advanced and sponsored by the Russian state of historical am amnesia and the literal rewriting of history, yet again. Even events that were never the subject of ideological or factual debate are suddenly starting to be contested. And as historical knowledge fails to be passed down among the general public, a new mythology is taking place. For example, just a few years ago, the idea of a state-owned news agency questioning the well-known facts of the Katyn massacre 
in which thousands of Polish officers were shot dead by the Soviets would have been impossible. For years and years and years, the Soviets said, no, it was the Germans, it was the Germans. Basically, this was the cream of the crop of the Polish intelligentsia and the top uh, military generals and leaders, and they were massacred by the Soviets. And for years and years and years, they were blamed on the Germans, blamed on the Germans, and then finally, it's like, no, the Russians, the Russians did it. But you know, now you can't even say that the cat. Now you can't even challenge the Katyn massacre. On the different article, the same state-owned news agency said that time spent in the notorious Gulag prison camps were a quote ticket to a better life. And even in Soviet times, when discourse was very limited and being in possession or even distributing Alexander Solzhenitsyn's book, The Gulag Archipelago could land people in prison, no one in the official media would have dared make that kind of judgment about the Stalinist meat grinder. There were universal ethical boundaries, invisible though they might have been. And the result of introducing this simplified version of history into the mass consciousness can best be seen in how Russians perceive what is the most important event for them in history, World War II. Putin himself has effectively rehabilitated the secret protocol of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact from 1939 in which the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany agreed to carve up Eastern Europe between them so that in the official version it was nothing less than a diplomatic triumph for the Soviet Union. There's Molotov actually signing the document, that's Ribbentrop with the white pocket square and there's Stalin looking quite contentedly on from the side. And in addition, a widespread idea has taken hold that the Red Army was blindsided by the suddenness of the German invasion in 1941 and that the Soviet Union had not prepared for war in order to avoid provoking Germany. And in fact, the German attack came as no surprise at all and the fear of provoking the Nazis was Stalin's own paranoia, although it did not stop him preparing for war in his own particular way. And indeed... Stalin's preparations would be disastrous for the Soviet Union. Back in 2005, 40% of a Levada poll respondents agreed that the leadership of the Red Army had been decimated by Stalin's purges. The mass arrests within the military shortly before the war broke out had remained common knowledge since the days of perestroika under Gorbachev. In 2021, just 17%, so 40 down to 17% of respondents agreed with the same statement. 23 percentage points in 16 years is a staggering degradation in Russians' knowledge of their history. And even today, Russian history is subject to manipulation. Or, as the French might say, plus ça change, c'est plus la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Thank you. And there's a, couple of, there's a couple of movies I could recommend. One of them is, is called The Death of Stalin, and it was written by a British writer called Armando Iannucci, and it's black, black, black comedy. Um, but basically everything in the movie is true, but it's so utterly absurd. You, you, you think, this, this can't possibly be true. But there is that scene where you have the two guards outside Stalin's room, and they hear this thump of Stalin literally collapsing on the floor. And they look at each other like, are you going in? Oh, I'm not going in. Are you going in? No, no. And then literally they find, eventually go in, they find Stalin lying there. And they're all like, oh my God, oh my God, what are we going to do? And they like, well, call a doctor. And they're like, we've sent all the doctors off to the camps or we've killed them all. So they end up bringing in like the rookie team, the B team of doctors are all saying, I don't know, I don't know. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's such dark humor, but it's, um, you know, it opens up with this, this um, again, it's just a bizarre scene where there's a classical music performance and the um, producer's sitting in the control box and the phone rings and he's like, yes, hello. And all of a sudden he's like, yes, Comrade Stalin. And he's like, was tonight's performance recorded? And he's like, did we record this tonight? And they're like, no. And he's like, 
get everybody back in here. So they literally call everybody back in and they're like, you're going to have to re-perform re, re this piece because we've got to make a record of it. And it's, it's what's, what's, also, what's also kind of adds to the kind of surreal nature of the movie is there's a lot of very well-known British actors, Steve Buscemi, the American actors, but they all keep their same accents. They all keep their, nobody puts on like a fakey, and there's, a, there's one particular British actor, J Jason Isaacs, who puts on this thick Yorkshire accent to play Zhukov, the Russian general, and he steals the movie. The other movie that's well worth watching is called Burnt by the Sun. And it actually came out, I think, in the early 90s. And it's about Colonel Kotov, who was a legitimate hero of the revolution in the Soviet Union. And he gets called to, he's at his summer dasha with his family. And then this figure from the past shows up and it's like, you know, the car is going to be coming for you this afternoon and we're going to take you to, take you back to Moscow. And so he's like, well, you know, by the way, you know, he, said, he says to him, do you know, do you know the number 2345? And he's like, well, you wouldn't know that because that's, that's Stalin's personal number and boy. When we get to Moscow, I'm going to call Stalin and you're in big trouble. And of course, Stalin is the one who's called for him to be brought to Moscow because he was a legitimate hero of the revolution and Stalin can't have real heroes of the revolution hanging around anymore because they know the facts. So that's, that's a much more serious film, but uh, both of those are very much worth, um, worth watching. So... Yes, sir. Hi. Um, good presentation. I have to be a little negative on this. I thought we were going to get more on current propaganda, like the KGB and what they're doing nowadays. I didn't realize it was mostly on Stalin, which it's good. I'm not knocking him, but it's uh, not what I expected. But I have two questions, if you don't mind. I, I used the Moscow Times on the internet to get information, is that a good thing? Because it seems to be... Uh... There are so many sources. I was, saying, I was saying before we started the talk, um, I, you know, I did some teaching back in the days of slide libraries, and I would not have been able to do this presentation without access to Google Images and buy. I mean, the number of sources out there on Russian history are, is limitless. Um, one over the other, I, I really don't. I, you're probably better sticking with kind of English language sources. And in terms of more, more um, talking about kind of more recent things, the title of the talk is Early Soviet Propaganda. So that was the title of the talk. Just another couple of easy ones here. Was the on the roof based on the Baltimore? Yeah. Uh, good question. Because at the end of the year on the roof, there seem to be the people away from their villages. And it's been a long time since I've seen that. I don't know. Yeah. And uh, the last thing, I heard that Putin, I think I read recently in the magazine, that Vladimir Putin was currently pushing the re-Stalinization of Russia. Is that true? The re- re, re of Russia. Well, I mean, I think, I think, I think it's quite widely known that the worst thing that ever happened as far as Vladimir Putin was concerned is that the Soviet Union went, broke up in 1989-1991 and that part of the idea of going into the Crimea, going into Ukraine, is to basically re-establish parts of the former Soviet Union that he perceives as having gone too far to the West. I mean, a lot of the old, some of the older, the other republics, I think, are still pretty much under kind of strong man dictatorial control but I think I think it's kind of widely accepted that Stalin would like to see the Soviet Union come back because that's when the Soviet Union was at its biggest and its most powerful um, but this you know this is not 90 this is 13 years. Are the Russian people so brainwashed that they can't see Stalin and Putin for what they are? Well the thing is I mean right now basically Putin has uh, he's shut down most he shut down most of the internet, he shut down most of the social media. So there's a large number of Russians who are getting... And apparently, it's like 60% of the Russian public 
get their, still get their news from TV. And TV is controlled by the state. So they are literally getting state propaganda. So when that's what, that's, this is one of the kind of undercurrents that I think will eventually play a larger factor is, you know, oh, they're on this, you know, military exercise. And then all of a sudden these folks are like, you know, apparently soldiers were like, they, the, the parents of these soldiers thought they were just on some military exercise. It's like, you know, if they could communicate, it's like, no, we're invading Ukraine. What do you mean you're invading Ukraine? I thought you were in, I thought you were just in a military exercise. So eventually, but the, you know, the truth will come out, but until, as long as he kind of keeps a lid on information and the dissemination of information, then it, you know, it's going to be hard. But I, you know, I think what will probably be is just as effective as when all of us, because I think a lot of Russians have gotten used to a certain Western standard of living. I mean, you may have seen there was footage of when the first McDonald's opened in Moscow and you know, there was a line around the block. Well, uh, you know, there's what, 800 McDonald's in, in Russia now? And eventually, once all, these, you know, once all these Western countries start pulling out and the economy starts going down the toilet and the rubles are worthless, Eventually, your average Russian is going to be like, well, why the hell is this happening? And, you know, they might put two and two together. Thank you for your talk. Um, I did have a question as well about subsequent Soviet leaders, if they ever tried to emulate kind of Stalin's approach to propaganda and how we are also seeing Putin using film, you know, imagery as well, photographs. Short answer, no. They certainly, um, the one thing I can really think of is there were the official photographs of people like, um, particularly, uh, who was it, um, Khrushchev, um, who was the other one? Um, Gorbachev. I mean, there was always the airbrushing of the official portrait, but there was certainly none of this full scale. I mean, as I say, pretty much right after 1954, there, there was, a, it was kind of like, I think it was almost as collective, like, whew, thank God that's over. Let's basically start slowly kind of putting the record straight. Um, but no, the, the, I mean, but I, I, I know what you're saying. I mean, there's that, you know, there's all those clips of Putin, you know, doing his judo moves or riding a horse without a shirt on or flying a fighter plane. I mean, he's, in his own way, he's kind of like, look how tough, look at the strong man, look how virile I am. So there's a little bit of that with Putin, but there's, there isn't the, because uh, actually one of the things I actually looked up was, you know, Photoshop, you know, Google search for like Photoshopped pictures of Putin. And I really couldn't find it, but there was the ones of him riding the horse without a shirt on and doing all these big manly activities out in the countryside. So there's a little bit of that, but he's he's also a lot younger, because um, after you had um, Stalin, then you had Khrushchev, then you had, the way I, the way I always remember Russian leaders is you go hairy bald, hairy bald, hairy bald. <laughs> so Lenin's bald, Stalin was hairy, Khrushchev was bald, then I think it was Andropov who was hairy, Chernenko. Then you had, um, who was the hairy um, one in the 60s and 70s? Brezhnev. Brezhnev. Brezhnev was hairy. Then you have um, Gorbachev, bald. Then you have uh, Yeltsin, hairy. Then you have Putin, bald. Medvedev, hairy. Back to Putin, bald. So that's how you remember, the, that's how you remember them. Bald, hairy, bald, hairy. Hey, it works for me. <laughs> <laughs> Can't do that with American presidents because I don't think there's ever been a bald, well, I don't think there's ever been an officially bald American president. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much and thanks for your support.